What's up, everybody? Welcome into this Tuesday edition of the Packaday Podcast here on YouTube. Of course, I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can always follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Got a great show lined up for you today. My main topic is going to be discussing my defensive grades, including my highest and lowest graded players, and just kind of my overall thoughts after I've been able to break down the defense in a little bit greater detail. Also want to talk a little bit of Corey Lindsley. I want to start by kicking things off, though, by talking a little bit about Tavon Austin. I'm sure you have heard by now that the Packers have signed Tavon Austin, not only to the practice squad, but to the active roster. So he is definitely somebody that they have some sort of plans for. I think this is going to be really interesting to see how this shakes out. Does this mean that Darius Shepard uh, goes down to the practice squad or is released outright. Of course, they would have to release him first to get him to the practice squad, but I don't see him being claimed. So does he go to the practice squad? Did they just kind of move on? Uh, I think that'll be an interesting thing to keep an eye on. I'd be sort of surprised if they kept, what, seven wide receivers at this point. You've got your top three, EQ, and then um, Malik Taylor, Darius Shepard, and then Tavon Austin would be seven with Tyler Irvin, the ability to be eight. Uh, maybe Irvin's injury is worse than we we thought, and maybe he ends up going on short-term IR uh, for a few weeks or something like that, which is why they made the move. So there could be some moving parts here, but if I had to venture a guess, I would say uh, things probably don't look the best for Darius Shepard, but we'll see. Certainly hoping the best for, for Shepard and always want to see the players succeed, but um, you could kind of see the writing on the wall a little bit with that if that were in case the move that were to be made. Um, as far as Tavon Austin goes, I mentioned this uh, last week. Uh, on my podcast titled, you know, the Packers take a look at Tavon Austin or whatever it was. The the idea of Tavon Austin is amazing. You've got this ultra fast kind of short shifty gadget type player, punt returner, kick returner. Um, you can kind of get him in the slot, get him in motion, you know, do all those sort of things. He's never really panned out to a, a full level, although he did have some success with, with Sean McVay uh, when he was with the Rams uh, during their time together. Uh, never really had success after that. He's been out of football, was on a practice squad earlier this year. But, uh, you know, I, I do think, and as I mentioned last week, that this is a wise investment. And uh, I talked uh, on a couple different places last week about how it seemed incredible to me that you can have a 69 player roster and not have anyone outside of Tyler Irvin who has any sort of return ability. Um, either the Colts dared them to, to return kicks. They didn't fear them you know, when they were punting the ball to the Packers because Green Bay has nobody on the roster. You could probably say that Jair Alexander would be a fairly explosive punt returner, but there's no way they're putting him back there. Um, and when he did get some chances, he did have some trouble with just fielding punts and, and with some muff punts and fumble issues and things like that way back when he was, I believe, a rookie at the time. So um, you know, they don't really have that type of player on the roster and now that's solved. Now they have a player as a kick returner, punt returner in Tavon Austin that they can use in that capacity, as well as take some of those Tyler Irvin snaps as a gadget player in the slot. Again, we've seen this year, you know, when Tyler Irvin has gone out, they haven't had that guy to really fill his spot. They've used Aaron Jones in that space, MVS. They've used a variety of different players, EQ a little bit last week, but nobody has that kind of quick twitch ability to kind of, you know, one cut, get up field, make somebody miss. You just don't have that sort of player on the roster right now. And I think this is a very, very, very low risk, potentially semi-high reward. Not high is probably aggressive, but there's a reward there if things pay off. And I'm not saying this is a Desmond Howard-esque signing. I'm not saying this is, you know, a Howard Green or any of those players that have kind of come in late and made an impact on the roster. But I think it's it's really smart and it's a it's an educated decision by Brian Gutekinds to try to shore up a position that uh, they don't really have on the roster outside of Tyler Irvin and see if, you know, maybe he can provide a spark as a returner, get Green Bay in a little bit uh, better field position. We know how dangerous this Packers offense is. And if Tavon Austin can help as a kick returner, punt returner, you know, maybe it's just getting it to the 30 instead of the 25, or maybe, heck, even just getting it to the 26 instead of pinned back at your own 19. You know, things like that can make a fairly significant difference. You know, if all of a sudden he can, you know, get a 15, 20 yard return, look out. That would be amazing in, in Green Bay. Um, that seems to happen, you know, with some regularity in other cities, but in Green Bay, those, those big returns have been an issue you know, certainly as of late, since probably Micah Hyde has been gone, uh, you know, so th this is a this is a smart signing by Brian Gutekunst. I think, again, the idea of Tavon Austin better than the actual player at this point, but uh, I think it was a wise signing to see what he can bring to the table and see if he can add a little bit of juice, both as a returner and as a slot and gadget player. 
Other big news, sounds like Corey Lindsley is going to be out three to six weeks. Uh, I think the big thing here is that it looks likely that he's going to be back in time for the playoffs. Even more reason to try to get that by just to buy Corey Lindsley a little bit more time. But uh, if he can get back by by week one of the or, you know first game of the playoffs, whether that's you know wild card or divisional round, hopefully divisional. But uh, if they can get him back for that. That would be a huge huge win. They certainly have the players for the time being to kind of hold down the fort. Uh, you know, Elton Jenkins has been very solid at center. You know, John. John Runyon Jr. has done a really nice job plugging that left guard spot. And they still have, assuming Lucas Patrick's going to be okay, which it sounds like he's going to be, uh, they still have one depth player left with Rick Wagner. And when you add in the versatility of players like Patrick and Billy Turner and Elton Jenkins, it means that kind of anyone could potentially go down and you still have one more starter or starting caliber player to move into that spot. So uh, hopefully no more injuries along the offensive line. Green Bay's getting a little bit weak there from a depth standpoint, may need to make a move. Really, it's just Rick Wagner and Yash Nijman on the active roster right now as far as depth goes. Um, so they're going to have to probably take a look and, and maybe add a, a player to the active roster along the offensive line or at least uh, pull a couple players up from the practice squad. The last note here before I get to my defensive grades, Kenny Stills did clear waivers. I would be very, very surprised if Green Bay uh, made a move for him, especially just with bringing in Tavon Austin. I know they're not the same type of player, but you're already looking at, you know, even if they brought Kenny Stills in, Lazard, Adams, and uh, MVS are going to be their top three wide receivers. And now all of a sudden EQ is getting going a little bit. Um, I just don't think that, it, it, I don't think they're going to pull that trigger. Whether they should or shouldn't is maybe a different conversation, but I don't foresee that happening. And again, even if they did, even if they signed him to a contract, um, don't get your hopes up too high that he all of a sudden comes in and starts getting 30, 40 snaps a game and is a prime player on this team. Uh, I think he's going to have to earn those snaps and prove that he can be a run blocker as well as a deep threat because we know how much this team values the ability to run block on the outside uh, as part of the you know part of what the, the wide receivers do in Green Bay. So don't see it happening. I won't get your hopes up too much. And even if you do see it come through, again, temper expectations because I, I think he's still going to be probably the number four, maybe even number five for the first few weeks that he would come in uh, before he would be a potential contributor. I think it might even take some injuries for him to get out on the field. All right, let's go over my grades. Uh, let me t start with my top three. And really, this was a top one and then a couple solid players and then a lot of negative grades this week, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, Darnell Savage was 1A, and I don't think that's going to surprise anyone. Anytime you have two big interceptions in a game, and I thought both of them were really nice plays on the football. Um, you have obviously the, the speed turn where he gets back, um, Shannon Sullivan in coverage, and then really just you know gets over the top and makes a great play on the ball as kind of a center fielder in that position. Really love that play from Darnell um, and just making sure that he secures the catch. I know it wasn't you know trying to go up against a 50-50 you know, ball and make a play, but still a really nice play uh, to get to that point, to read the ball and then make a play on it. And then you know, later on, backpedaling, he jumped a little early, still made the interception, read the play perfectly, mentioned in his post-game press conference that, you know, he read the play. And it's something that Minnesota ran in week one. You love his football IQ. He's You can see the game, le, you know, legitimately slowing down for him at this point. And that's a huge sign for this defense. And he comes up, th those two big plays, you know, those those were coming based on how Darnell Savage has played over the course of the last few weeks. And I think that, you know, hopefully this is the coming out for him. And that just boosts his confidence even more and gives him the, you know, the, the, you know, the playmaking ability that he has innately to just kind of come out and really show itself even more. Uh, Kevin King was second on my list. Would have rated even higher had he not dropped a wide, you know, wide open interception if, the, if such a thing exists. Uh, you know, at the end of the game, which really, you know, forced or allowed uh, the Bears to put more points on the board after King dropped the interception, but. It wasn't a great game for King, still allowed a couple completions, but three pass breakups on the day, made a really nice play coming up on the ball and, and making a firm tackle uh, on an outside, I don't know if it was a uh, like a swing pass or what it was, but uh, early in the game made a really aggressive tackle. Um, just, get, you know, there was another play too where... Uh, he's just kind of coming blocked on the outside and you see him kind of come running in and you know you, you don't see cornerbacks doing that a lot and he's coming in making a play and getting involved in, in kind of the middle of a scrum at, towards the end of a running play um, you know you often see corners just kind of you know remain blocked by the wide receiver towards the end of a play this was a this was a nice aggressive play by Kevin King just like to see that out on the field and then Dean Lowry was actually my third highest graded player nothing significant but I thought he put a really you know really nice game on tape um, you know no 
no real negatives from Dean Lowry. You didn't see him blown out of, uh, bl you know, blown out of the hole or anything like that. They, it seemed that they used him a little bit more sparingly in this game, which I think is the right way to go. And he kind of responded with a little bit more juice. He had one really nice play where he really fought through a double team and, and made a play on the uh, running back right near the line of scrimmage. So a uh, good sign that Dean Lowry, you know, is getting some positive grades. It wasn't a huge grade by any stretch, but I still like to see him in the positive after really struggling to start this season. My three lowest graded players, uh, Christian Kirksey, uh, by far and away, just thought he looked two steps slow in this game, struggled in coverage, struggled in run defense. Um, even when he was, you know, kind of squared up with David Montgomery, Montgomery made a miss a couple times in the open field, uh, just a step slow to react. Um, just hasn't been the player that Green Bay has really wanted him to be in any way, shape or form. This is a, a pretty negative grade for Christian Kirksey. Um, Zadarius Smith was actually my second lowest graded player, and I know uh, Pro Football Focus was a little bit higher on him than I was. Uh, they, I think they ended up with you know giving him five pressures on the day. I think that was a little bit aggressive, but really in the second half, really struggled to generate pressure. And I know Green Bay had a lead at that point, but um, I'm going to go over the pressure numbers in just a second as well. Um, but Zadarius actually my second lowest player, you know, rated player in this game, which is very very surprising for Z. And then Shannon Sullivan was my third lowest graded player, another player that PFF and I disagreed agreed on. Um, one gave up the completion on fourth and 11, which really set up Chicago for their second touchdown of the game and kind of kept the game going a little bit and, and not, you know, didn't allow Green Bay to just kind of get out of there with a, a really a massive victory. Um, they ended up scoring a touchdown after that. Also got massively beat on a uh, post. It was like kind of like a, I don't know if it was like a stutter and go, but it was like a stutter and a post um, play, you know, late in the game where if Trubisky saw him, he would have been, you know, would have been beat easily and would have been a touchdown on the play. A um, couple other plays in the game where I just would have liked a little bit better effort from, from Chandon. Did, I thought he did have a really nice play on the interception by Darnell Savage, just kind of cutting off his receiver without having any sort of pass interference and kind of giving Savage that lane to the football. But um, I didn't think this was, was Chandon's best effort overall. And then just a lot of negatives. You know, talk about Preston Smith and saying, all right, this is this is the game that Preston Smith needed. He had the, the fumble you know, recovery for a touchdown. He had a big sack in the game. But you go back and look at it, that was it. There was not really any more pressure from him. He had one other, you know, kind of pressure, but a sack, one pressure, the the, the fumble recovery for a touchdown. You might say, Andy, well, that, that's a that's a damn good football game. He scored a touchdown. He had a sack. He had a pressure. Like, wh what more do you want from the guy? But the the fumble is right place, right time. And I'm not saying I didn't give him a positive grade on the play, but you know, he's blocked on the play. He looks down. The 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 ball is at his feet. He picks it up and he runs untouched to the end zone. You know. And any 11 players on the field would have done the exact same thing if they were in his spot. Randy Ramsey would have done that. Oren Burks would have done that. Hell, you know, BJ Raji, you know, would have done that. Whomever in that spot, you know, would have done that if they were in that spot. So it's not to take away from Preston on the play. It was a good play. He, he found the football. He, he made a plan and scored a touchdown. It's a positive grade, but you're not going to give him a, a massive grade on it because the ball fell to his feet and he picked it up and ran on touch to the end zone. The sack was a really nice play, <clears throat> and I, th I think it was a, a decent situation too. I don't recall. If, I think it was either a third down or at least it, it was an important play uh, earlier in the game. It wasn't just in garbage time, but after that, just consistently blocked again. Um, you know, didn't make any plays. And, and the, the the edge rushers in this game, and, re and really the defensive line and edge rushers, Clark graded poorly. Preston Smith was in the negatives. Zedarius graded poorly. Rashawn Gary graded poorly. Um, j just the pressures in this game. PFF had them at 14 pressures for the game, which I thought was generous. Uh, all both the edge rushers and the the defensive line combined 14 total pressures which I thought was actually generous I didn't I didn't think it was quite that much but uh, Mitch Trubisky behind a very shaky offensive line dropped back dropped back to pass 53 times in this game and they mostly brought you know four man rushes in this game so if you look at 53 times four 212 rushes basically from the Packers defense 212 and, and PFF, I think, generously gave them 14 pressures on the day. 14 out of somewhere around 212. It just wasn't good enough, and this was a this was a low grade overall from the defense. Um, I, I didn't love this game. This was a, a situation where they played a very bad offense. Mitch Trubisky bailed them out of some situations. Um, give Darnell Savage credit. Give the the Packers credit for forcing their fumble, returning it for a touchdown. And I don't want to take too much away from a defense who, um, you know, when this mattered, it was forty one to ten, and uh, you know, seven of those points were scored by the defense, so they were at a net three points basically for the day when when things really mattered. 
Um, but I, I just didn't see an overall performance from this defense that I was really hoping to see when I put on the tape. Um, you know, don't take away anything. They won the game and they, they, you know, they, they got some big plays against the Bears. But I do think a lot of this was a, a bad Bears offense, just as much as it was, you know, a, a solid to average day, maybe slightly below average for the defense. So that's going to do it for me. I know I'm long today. I apologize, but I had a lot to go that I wanted to go over. Um, I'm going to try to get to my offensive grades tomorrow. I uh, appreciate you always for listening. Make sure to check out the Pack a Day podcast today, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.